In today's program, we are going to focus on another university and its efforts to address um, its legacy of anti-Semitism, uh, Stanford University. Now, I have to admit that one of the reasons I wanted to include Stanford in this series is that I used to teach there myself and have a kind of semi-insider perspective on, on its history and um, on what the culture is like there. But it's also an important case study for our purposes because um, actually before um, the events of this last year um, into 2022, um, Stanford um, made the decision to confront its own legacy of anti-Semitism in the history of its admissions and in other ways um, by undertaking a formal study of its own history um, and making recommendations for how the university should redress that history of discrimination and move forward um, in light of its discoveries. The person who uh, led the effort uh, to study that history and the co-author of the resulting report is our guest uh, this afternoon, um, Dr. Ari Kelman. Um, Ari is the Jim Joseph Professor of Education and Jewish Studies in Stanford's Education School, uh, where he has been leading research and training graduate students in the field of education as it applies to the Jewish community. Um, I wanted to invite him to this series because of his role in Stanford's effort to face up to its legacy of anti-Semitism but also because he's such a wonderful scholar of Jewish education, um, working hard to, to develop a deeper um, research grounded approach to how, pe how people learn about uh, Jewishness and, and making and being Jewish. Um, in fact, he has a forthcoming book on Jewish education that is coming out from Rutgers University Press. I've had a chance to read an advanced copy and I highly recommend uh, that book to you if you have an interest in the future of Jewish education. So it's my pleasure now to introduce Professor Kelman. He will be speaking for about 30 minutes, after which we will have time for Q&A. You can use the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen to submit questions. Um, after the presentation, I will be reappearing on the screen uh, along with Dr. Ann Albert, our Director of Public Programs, and we will be having a conversation with Ari informed by your questions. So without further ado, Professor Kelman. Thanks, Professor Weitzman. Um, it's wonderful to be here. Thank you for the invitation, for the um, for the hospitality, and to your whole team for putting the series together and for um, inviting me to talk today. Before I get started, I do want to say one thing. Today is my dad's uh, 82nd birthday, so a happy birthday to him. Um, although there are cheerier things one wishes to talk about um, on one's birthday. Um, but as Steve mentioned, I was asked in 2021 to uh, undertake a study into the history of anti-Semitism in Stanford admissions. And what I'm going to share with you primarily today are the results of that study, uh, together with a little bit of background. So here's just what's going to, this sort of summary of what we're going to do today. I'm going to give some context for our investigation. I'm going to talk about the charge that we were given as a committee. I chaired the committee. Um, how we went about our work, the methods that we used. I'm gonna summarize the findings, the intention to limit the number of Jewish students at Stanford, where we found evidence of that intention, where we found evidence of the impact, how the university addressed or denied um, questions, concerns, and accusations that it had in fact practiced biases against Jewish, uh, Jewish applicants. Talk a little bit about the language of quotas. It's a bit of a technical part, but an important one nevertheless. Uh, highlight some of the high level conclusions, gesture, I think gently to the some continuities and discontinuities between what we observed in this study and what we're seeing on campus at the present. Then I'll cover the recommendations that were made to the campus community as part of the task force's report. So the larger context for the investigation, uh, there are three primary ones. One was that over the latter part of the second decade of the 21st century, beginning I think strongly in 2016, but maybe even prior to that, we began to see more overt, more public expressions of anti-Semitism in American life and politics and culture. The Charlottesville um, Unite the Right uh, rally in 2017 um, was, I think, for many American Jews, a kind of eye-opening moment. Um, the Tree of Life congregation shooting in 2018 was obviously another more tragic one. And we began to see this more and more anti-Semitism rising in American, um, in American culture and politics. The other context for the investigation uh, was that universities around the country were beginning to investigate their own past. Harvard had its legacy of slavery project. 
Princeton removed Woodrow Wilson's name from the public policy school and many, many others in which universities began to reckon with their own histories of exclusionary politics, exclusionary policies, and even the, um, the perspectives, politics, opinions, behaviors of some of their founders in ways that were fundamental and in many ways unsettling, but it became was, there was a, there, we, and I think we're still in that moment of universities reckoning with their pasts. Um, there was a very specific instigating moment that led to our, our study, although it drew on these larger contexts, and that was the publication of a Substack newsletter from a historian named Charles Peterson, who is uh, now um, a historian working in the Stanford University Libraries, ironically. But at the time, he was, I think, a postdoc at, um, at Cornell. And he published a, a, a post called How I Discovered Stanford's Jewish Quota, in which he surfaced a memo that he found when he was doing research on the Stanford admissions practices from the 1950s. And I'll talk about that memo shortly. Charles's article uh, caught the eye of our president at the time, Mark Tessier Levine. And um, President Tessier Levine, recognizing the rising uh, anti Semitism in the United States, recognizing the um, the uh, movement among colleges and universities to reckon and investigate with their own past. And finally, um, responding in a way to longstanding um, suspicions and accusations that Stanford did practice exclusionary policies against Jews. Um, uh, President Tessie Levine asked me to head a task force to investigate the memo and, and what else we knew about it. And so we were given two charges. The first was to research the history of admissions policies and practices for Jewish students at Stanford, including the allegations in the blog post. And our second charge was to make recommendations about how to enhance Jewish life on campus. So it had a historical dimension and it had a contemporary dimension. Um, I'm gonna to talk today mostly about the historical dimension. I will at the end talk about the recommendations we made um, and, uh, and how those have been taken up by the university since. So I have to say, I chaired the task force, but I was I did not work alone. I was supported by and consulted by um, uh, a number of wonderful colleagues in and around the university, in particular, the two graduate research assistants, um, Jem Jebia and Erica Bullock, who were with me most of the time doing the research, but the entire team, entire task force was, uh, was wonderful. And I wanted to give them uh, credit at the top. So how did we do it? We did our work because we were looking historically, it was mostly archival. We looked at primary archival collections, mostly within the Stanford University archives. Um, so we spent lots and lots and lots of hours um, in our archives trying to reconstruct the history of Stanford admissions on the large scale, and then how Stanford admissions um, did or didn't <clears throat> address uh, Jewish admits separately. And we looked at presidential papers, we looked at institutional papers, we looked at papers of departments. Uh, at one point, well, twice actually, Stanford did a massive uh, self-study uh, of the undergraduate curriculum. We looked at the papers that led to the publication of those two reports. We also consulted many, many supplemental sources, including Stanford yearbooks, Stanford newspaper, uh, the Stanford student newspaper, the historical society's oral histories, which included a lot of really important information that we were able to pull in. And I called on resources from a number of other archives that I knew in the American Jewish world. And we also conducted a number of interviews with Stanford alumni, um, interviews with current Stanford students, and then um, some focus groups as well in order to inform the recommendations that we are asked to make. So before we start talking about the, the particulars of this case, I have to introduce you to three figures who play a prominent role in the story I'm going to tell. The first uh, on the left of the screen is J.E. Wallace Sterling. He was the president of Stanford from 1949 to 1968. He was assisted <clears throat> in his office by Fred Glover, who's the person on the right. Glover was his assistant, but Glover was really, he really functioned as a chief of staff. Everything ran through Glover um, to get to Sterling. And it was under Sterling's, um, during Sterling's tenure that Stanford really moved from being a kind of good local university that drew the majority of its students from the Bay Area and from California to one of uh, national stature and really to began to be considered one of the elite universities in the United States. And so Sterling is really credited with doing a lot of that work along with his provost for the time, Fred Terman. Sterling's assistant was Fred Glover and the director of admissions for approximately the same period was Rixford Snyder, the person in the middle. Now Stanford, uh, Sterling was appointed in 1949 
Only in 1947 did Stanford appoint its first director of admissions. Before then, admissions at Stanford were, was handled primarily by the office of the registrar, which meant that registration and admissions were um, housed in the same office. And the admissions director didn't even have his own budget. His budget was overseen entirely by that of the registrar. And in 1947, they appointed their first director of admissions. He did not like his job, and he handed the reins over to Snyder in 1950. In 1953, uh, Fred Glover, the assistant to Sterling, writes this memo, and this was the memo that Charles Peterson found and published on his uh, Substack page. And in February 1943, 1953, sorry, Glover writes uh, the memo to Sterling about a memo about a meeting that he had with um, with Rixford Snyder, the director of admissions, and he writes Ricks, and that was. Snyder's nickname, Rex is concerned that more than one quarter of the applications from men are from Jewish boys. He continues on to say, there are, he said, a number of high schools in Los Angeles, Beverly Hills and Fairfax are examples whose student body runs from 95 to 98% Jewish. If we accept a few Jewish applicants from these schools, the following year we get a flood of Jewish applicants, the letter went on to say. It continued, Ricks feels that this problem is loaded with dynamite, and he wanted you to know about it, as he says that the situation forces him to disregard our stated policy of paying no attention to the race or religion of applicants. Finally, the letter concluded, I told him that I thought his current policy made sense, and that it was a matter of requiring, it was a matter requiring the utmost discretion, and that I would relay these highlights of our conversation to you and let Ricks know if you had different views. So we have is an internal memo from the assistant to the president to the president, effectively from the chief of staff to the president, about a meeting in which Snyder says he's worried about the flood of applications from Jewish boys. He feels that they, um, if he admits all of them, it uh, it just increases the the number of uh, applications from Jewish applicant uh, Jewish boys. And he says that he is poised to disregard the stated Stanford's own stated policy of paying no attention to race or religion. And Glover says, I think that's okay. Glover gives it his tacit approval and sends the memo to the president. Now, we don't know who knew. Um, we don't know exactly who knew about the memo. We know who wrote it, and we know the meeting that it reported on. But up at the top, there's a rubber stamp, and it has a bunch of lines with check marks on them. Um, and this was what people did in the office uh, at the time is when a memo would be circulated rather than copy the memo a number of times, they would circulate it. And after you, after you read it, you would saw it, you would put a check by the initials for your name. And so we know, so here's a close up of that. It's a little blurry, I apologize. But right at the top, it says J-E-W-S, which is the initials of President J.E. Wallace Sterling. And we know that Marguerite Cole, his secretary read it, MC, we know that Doug Whitaker, who was the provost, read it, um, uh, DW, DFW, and we know that Lillian Carolyn Owen, the executive secretary, read it. So these three people saw it, read it, and checked it. But Sterling doesn't check the box or doesn't uh, signal on the line that he read it. So there's an open question as to whether or not Sterling really had read the memo um, or not. The two options this reads is Sterling read the memo, and as he sometimes did, and we found evidence of this in the archive, just didn't check the box. Um, but he'd read it. The other is that he didn't read it. Um, and that somebody, maybe Cole, maybe Whitaker, maybe Owen, decided that it was best to protect the, the president from this information and that he shouldn't get the memo. Um, so we're not completely sure, we're not 100% sure if Sterling knew about the memo at all. But what took place on his watch in his office, uh, we are more certain about because we found evidence of it elsewhere. I have to say that uh, going into this project, the archetype for anti-Semitism anti in admissions was that of the Ivy Leagues from earlier in the century. This story is documented by um, Jerome Carabell's magnificent work, The Chosen. He's going to be a, a speaker, I think the last speaker in the series. Um, I highly recommend attending that talk. The book is, is uh, fantastic, and it was incredibly helpful to us in many, many ways for setting the stage for what anti-Semitism in, in admissions in elite universities looked like. And I went into this project expecting to find some of the traces and some of the evidence that Carabell, some of the evidence at Stanford that Carabell had documented in his studies of Harvard and Yale and uh, 
and Princeton. Um, there's another study by uh, the historian um, Harold, Harold, Harold Wexler uh, about Columbia that tells a very similar stale to, story to the one that Carabell tells. Um, but in Carabell's research, he found copious documentation about the number of Jewish applicants, about efforts, very specific efforts to exclude Jewish applicants, about arguments about whether or not or how to classify Jewish applicants in order to exclude them, about why the presence of too many Jewish students might appear to the leadership of those elite universities um, a threat or uh, improper when it came to considering what they thought to be the uh, identity of the university and its students. So we entered in, so I had read Carabell's book, I entered into the archives with Carabell's book imprinted in my mind, and we found almost nothing that resembled the kinds of evidence that Carabell found in his study. We found no memos discussing strategies. We found no evidence of conversations among members of the admissions team about how to classify uh, students and whether they were Jewish or not. We found very little evidence of the way that Stanford regarded itself or its students. There was no concept in the way there was a concept of the Harvard man or the Yale man of the Stanford man that, that we found in the, in the documentation. And so for many months, we labored trying to put together a story, but didn't find anything quite as explicit as, uh, as, as the story that Carabell documented. And this was frustrating to us and the picture was unclear because the memo, while fairly damning about Rixford Snyder's intent, does not actually give us the impact of Snyder's actions. It doesn't evidence that any action was taken. One of the possibilities could be that Sterling saw the memo, called Snyder into his office and said, don't you dare break with our policy. Don't you dare count race or religion in our admissions processes. Um, but we don't know because we don't have a response from Sterling. Uh, all we have is the statement of intent by Sterling and the tacit okay from Glover. And then we started looking and we found evidence for exclusion in two places primarily, not on the admission side of, well, one is on the admission side of things and one was on the enrollment side of things. So the first place we found it was in the recruitment documents from the Office of Admissions. They would go on tours of, of schools all around the country. And in 1951, um, this is kind of a sample uh, recruitment itinerary for, I think it was Nat Allen who took this trip. Um, and you can see in the on the bottom, I think I highlighted this here, and on the top, on Tuesday, January 9th, they visited Beverly Hills High, University High School, and Santa Monica High School. And on Friday, February 9th, they visited Hollywood High School and Fairfax High School and Susan Miller Dorsey High School. Now, Beverly Hills, why do I focus on Beverly Hills and Fairfax? These are two high schools in the LA area. Fairfax is in Los Angeles, Beverly Hills High School serves Beverly Hills. They were both identified by Glover and Snyder as having high populations of Jewish students. And we've confirmed that they in fact did have high populations of Jewish students from demographic studies of the Los Angeles Jewish community at the time. In fact, Beverly Hills High School and Fairfax High School served two of the most densely Jewish neighborhoods in Los Angeles at the time. So we focused on these two schools they appear in on recruitment itineraries from the early 1950s. Um, but then in 1955, here's, um, here's another uh, recruitment itinerary from a trip to Southern California. The two high schools disappear. We found them on a, a few itineraries from before 1953, which was when the memo was written. They drop off of recruitment efforts in the 1950s. Now, high schools came and went from recruitment uh, letters. It could be that the high schools were sending such qualified students that uh, they didn't really feel the need to recruit in the way they did. It could be that their recruitment strategies changed. Um, it could be um, sometimes high school would disappear for two years and then come back. Sometimes there was a change in the leadership of the university of the excuse me of the high school or the um, uh, uh, what the the, um, the counseling office and they lost track of a high school and then it came back. But we saw them disappear and never come back after 1953, which is when the memo was written. The second and uh, I think more convincing piece of evidence was found not in admissions, but in enrollment data. Every year from the 40s to the 70s, Stanford's Office of the Registrar would publish these internal um, uh, reports about enrolled students, not admitted students, but enrolled students. Um, or uh, students who were enrolling. And they would list 
And they included all kinds of demographic data, including the kinds of schools they went to. And they broke out by state, public schools and private schools. And so we have here from the Registrar of 1953, the report, which included Beverly Hills High School here. Uh, so it listed the states. It could Beverly Hills High School, 47 students, and it had their grade point averages as well, in addition to other demographic data. And the same was true of Fairfax. All that was included in the registrar's reports. When we started looking at the registrar's reports, we saw a sharp decline in the number of students that were admitted from these two high schools. And I'll give you just a piece of that story here. Um, a tricky thing in the way that the numbers were reported was that they were reported in, in enrolled students from high schools in three year, um, over the course of three years. So when it says Beverly Hills High School, 67 students, those were not, Beverly Hills High School didn't send 67 students in 1952. They sent 67 students between 1950, 51 and 52, basically. Um, but that number declines by 1950, 1952 to 1955, 1953 to 1956, we see it drop from 67 over three years to 13 over three years. From Fairfax, the drop-off is much sharper even still from 1949 to 1952, Fairfax sent 20 students. Um, and by 1952 to 1955, and remember the memo was written in 1953, that drops to one student. Now, because these are three-year aggregates, so if we're looking at the Fairfax numbers, the number one, you have one student in 1952 to 1955, and one student from 53 to 56, which means that some number of years within those four years, uh, Fairfax was sending zero students. But we couldn't tell, Let's even if we were to take the middle number of 52 to 55, we couldn't tell just by looking at the registrar's reports if that student was admitted in 1952 or 1954. We didn't know what the order of numbers was. So using some, uh, uh, math and a paper and pencil, which I realized I could have done an easier way after I checked it with a mathematics graduate student, we calculated <clears throat> what are the possible combinations of enrollments from any of the high schools. So here's the part of the table from Fairfax High School. We see that in 1950, one possibility could be that in 1950, they enrolled five students, 1951, they enrolled seven, 1952, they enrolled eight, and then 1953, again, the year of the memo, that drops to zero. Possible combination number two gives a different arrangement of the numbers, but they still have to end up um, sort of adding up to the total number over the three years. For Fairfax, for Beverly Hills High School, because the numbers were higher, the number of possible combinations is much longer, but the story it tells is basically the same. Now, if you were a Jewish person in Los Angeles in the 1950s, and you lived in one of those two neighborhoods, or you lived in a, a neighboring neighborhood, um, you probably began to hear on the street that Stanford was not admitting Jewish students because all these Jewish, these schools that had previously sent significant numbers of Jewish students began sending very few students. And claims began to surface that Stanford was practicing um, uh, admissions that were biased against Jewish students. And very quickly, 1956, um, uh, Stanford comes out and uh, Snyder comes out in the LA Times and says, as far as I'm concerned, we do not consider race or groups of any sort. If one group applies heavily, there will be a larger number of them ad admitted. And I was in 1956, in the, in the Stanford Daily, also in 1956, he reiterates this and he reiterates this again in 1964. Over and over, Snyder and the administ administration um, say that they do not use a quota, that they do not concern race or group identities of any sort, that every case is handled individually. And they do this not just in the public, in newspapers, but they do it when individual complaints are raised to the university as well. So um, Judge Gus Solomon, who is a judge in um, an alum of Stanford and a judge in uh, Portland, Oregon, writes a letter in December, 1954. This is the year after that first memo was written. Uh, and Solomon says, I'm worried. I heard from a friend that there's, you know, that their child wasn't admitted because they were Jewish. Can you please tell me if this is true? He writes to the president. The president sends the, the letter to Glover. Um, and Glover says, uh, Glover responds very harshly. We are never accused of being anti-Catholic or anti-Methodist, but the charge does seem to arise sometime when a Jewish candidate is involved, that the university is anti-Jewish. He continues, if we had such information, he says, we, didn't even, we don't collect that, that data about our students because if we had such information, we could defend ourselves better against charges of discrimination. But if we maintained it, 
we would be open to charges that we kept the data to establish quotas. So he says, we don't keep data on religion or race about our admitted students. Finally, he says in a sort of um, uh, uh, an attack on, uh, on Judge Solomon, he says, it disturbs us deeply to have such rumors circulating as you have heard. And I hope that the above information will answer the questions which have been raised in your own mind. Now, bear in mind that the memo that reports on Snyder's intention to bar Jewish students or to reduce the number of Jewish students was written by Fred Glover. Glover knew that, Glover knew that Snyder had this intention. And yet in this last little paragraph, he sort of turns the blame around to Solomon and says, you're, you're making it up. It's appeared in your mind. I don't know what you're talking about. I hope I've calmed your fears. Um, but Glover didn't work alone and Snyder didn't work alone. This is from a letter from 1961, another complaint from 1961. This is a handwritten letter that was stapled um, to a, a draft response uh, to another member of the Stanford community. It says, okay, Fred, written from Snyder to Fred Glover, I'm holding a letter pending a reply from you before dropping in box. And he signed it and says, Mr. Mr. Snyder notified that Fred said it was okay, 725. So Snyder and Glover, Glover and other members of the administration are in communication about their efforts during this time. They know what one another is doing and they advance a, uh, uh, a pretty unified and pretty uh, aggressive um, campaign of denial throughout. And they deny, um, they deny these cases to alumni. They deny complaints to the Anti-Defamation League, which twice is brought in to investigate. They deny to uh, rejected students and their families. And eventually by the mid-1960s, there's a complaint from a Jewish member of the Board of Trustees and they deny it again there. Now, I wanna say a word about quotas. In the, early 19, in the late 1940s, early 1950s, the Anti-Defamation League and the American Jewish Committee um, put a very strong effort forth to reduce quotas in primarily in professional schools, dental schools, medical schools, but also in higher education. And they framed it around quotas and they called this national campaign, Crack the Quota. Um, and this fixated the kind of langu the language that was used in common currency around barriers to admissions around quotas. And so often when complaints would come in, they would come in in the language, using the language of quotas. And in fact, when people recalled uh, having heard that Stanford wasn't admitting students, they also used the language of quotas. So uh, Robin Kennedy, who was an alum, um, graduated in 1968. Uh, I, when I, I heard and uh, graduated from, I think, um, uh, North Hollywood High School, if I'm not mistaken, either Hollywood High or North Hollywood High, I apologize for not knowing Robin. Uh, I heard when I was in high school that there was a Jewish quota, she says. Paul Seaver, who was a member of the English faculty who joined having taught at Reed College and then moved to Stanford said, the kids I knew at Reed said, you can't go to that place. They don't admit you, certainly not from Los Angeles. These kids were by and large from Los Angeles. I couldn't believe it, but it was true. And Mark Mancall, who was a, a professor of history here for many years said, I was told when I graduated Hollywood High School, don't apply to Stanford because Jews have a very difficult time getting into Stanford. I didn't apply to Stanford. Now the language of quotas, uh, is very specific. It speaks to creating a number that is a limit to the number of admissions that, that is possible. Um, and so Stanford, went, when Stanford denied that it had quotas, it was technically telling the truth, um, but it was occluding the fact that it was using other ways of excluding Jewish students from attending. Now I point at Kennedy and Seaver and Mancall because they were all, in Seaver's case, talking about students from Los Angeles, in Kennedy and Mancall's case, being from Los Angeles. This was well known that Stanford had a policy of restricting the number of Jewish admits, was well known among Jews of Los Angeles. When I did interviews, however, with um, Jewish alums from Stanford from around the country, many of whom did not hear about this if they were not from Los Angeles, many of whom hadn't heard that Stanford had restrictions on Jewish students until they got to Stanford and they met Jewish kids from LA. So among Jews from LA, it was very prominent if you were outside of Los Angeles, it was not well known. So these three sort of sources for us, the drop, the, the um, omission of these two high schools from the, uh, um, the recruitment itineraries, the reduction of, Jew of students from these two high schools known to have high preponderances of Jewish students, and the prevalence of the knowledge among Jewish students from Los Angeles, all, all 
triangulate a story that says there was action taken against these two high schools at least uh, to reduce the number of Jewish students on campus. So in conclusion, just four points. Rixford Snyder, the director of admissions, took actions to suppress the number of Jewish students admitted to Stanford during the early 1950s. Snyder acted with the knowledge of other members of the university administration, including the assistant to the president and the provost. Remember, he signed that first memo, neither of whom took steps to stop him. Members of the Stanford administration regularly misled parents and friends of applicants, alumni, outside investigators from the ADL and trustees who raised concerns about these actions throughout the 1950s and into the 1960s. And although we don't know how many years Snyder suppressed the number of Jewish students, the effects lasted for decades. And if you talk to people who applied in the 70s and 80s, and I've gotten emails from many, many people who applied and either didn't get in or people who didn't apply, um, said that it was well known in their community of Jewish, uh, Jewish Los Angelinos that Stanford had a bias against Jewish applicants. So I want to reflect for a second before I talk about the recommendations, discontinuities and continuities with the present. So there are three discontinuities and one, I think, powerful source of continuity. The three discontinuities of what we're seeing now versus what we see th saw then was the locus of anti-Semitic intent. In, our, in the story that we told and in the, re the research that we did uh, in, the, in the Stanford newspapers, this was the administration acting against applicants. Now it seems most of the anti-Semitic tension exists between among students, student to student. And, and uh, addressing those concerns requires a different administrative structure than it would be if the source of anti-Semitic effort was being uh, sort of channeled from, was being directed from the administration. The second is the question of who's immediately impacted. In the case of the 1950s, in the case of admissions, the impacted parties were really Jewish applicants, non-Stanford students, because until they're admitted, they're not students. And now the anti-Semitism in the community is really impacting everybody, but primarily people who have either attended Stanford in the past and are now alums, or who are currently um, students, but not uh, uh, potential students or applicants. Although I understand that conversations about where parents want to send their children to college is impacted by this conversation today for sure. And finally, uh, the role of politics and expressions of anti-Semitism on campus, that was simply not the case in the 1950s and it dominates, I think, today. The continuity between the past and the present, and I, and I think those are important because they should shape the way that we talk about what is happening now in light of what's happened in the past. The continuity is shocking uh, to me, and it's something that I think about regularly when I reflect on the work that I did with the task force, which is that there was a certain casualness, there was a certain ease with which Snyder just said, well, there are too many Jewish applicants, um, so we should just reduce them. And it was almost as, uh, it wasn't quite an afterthought, but it was almost as if uh, there was no other additional expression of animus toward Jewish people or the Jewish community in the papers that we found or in Snyder's writings. Um, but he saw a problem and he blamed it on the Jews. Um, and it's that sort of like, uh, I, the, the word that keeps coming to mind is this sort of casual assignation of blame to the Jewish population, Jewish community that was gonna help him solve a problem that was not caused by uh, Jewish students or Jewish applicants or Jewish people. And that sort of ease with which Jews are blamed for problems for which they're not responsible, I think, is a strong continuity between the past and the present, unfortunately. I'm gonna wrap up very briefly with the recommendations that we made to the university. These were underway already um, uh, last year, although they got, uh, uh, we are not, I would say perfect on any measure, but I believe we are making progress on some of them. The first was that the university acknowledge and apologize for its actions. And the president uh, at the time uh, when the report was released, which was the fall of 2022, uh, released a very, what I found to be a very powerful and moving public apology for its uh, participation in missions practices designed to discriminate against Jewish students. Um, it acknowledged its efforts and apologized for it publicly. Both of those are uh, available um, online. The remainder of the recommendations um, were really about exploration, education, and enforcement. So to undertake a comprehensive study of contemporary Jewish life at Stanford, to develop and include modules addressing Jews and Jewish identity and appropriate educational trainings. The ASSE, which is the student government, <clears throat> passed a resolution 
um, to recognize anti-Semitism in our community. It actually passed two resolutions, one in 2016, one in 2019, but it never took action on them. So we make a recommendation to the SSU that it take action to make good on their own uh, resolutions. That the university alter the opening of the school year so it doesn't coincide with the Jewish high holidays, specifically Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur, and I'm actually on a committee now that's making that permanent. Um, that they provide for student religious and cultural needs in housing and dining, and finally, that they clarify the relationship between the university and Stanford Hillel, um, which is uh, sometimes tense and sometimes complementary, but uh, often unclear. Um, finally, I just want to thank everybody who helped out uh, in putting the task force together. I again want to reiterate my gratitude to the CAT Center and to Professor Weitzman for inviting me, and I'm happy to take any questions. Uh, Professor Kelman, thank you so much. That was so informative. Um, and I'm speaking as somebody who grew up in Los Angeles and applied to Stanford in the 1980s and did not get in. Um, so I'm going to ask um, one historical question, one question about the present, and then we'll turn things over to uh, uh, Dr. Anna Albert, who will ask questions on behalf of the audience. Um, so my historical question is, um, I once had a conversation with the former president of Stanford, I think it's not a secret, Donald Kennedy. And he told me um, that when he was a young faculty member uh, at Stanford, that um, Jews were also excluded from the faculty. And I'm wondering if your if your research revealed anything about Jews being excluded from the faculty as well as from you know in terms of the admissions discrimination. We heard lots of stories about that. Mark Mark Mancall, the history professor that I quoted in the study, um, has a lot of pretty colorful stories about that. He joined the faculty, I think, in the late '60s or early '70s. Um, we are really focused on the question of admissions. Um, and that question turned out to be so large because it, when we first started looking, um, we were like, well, how, in order to understand if there was a bias against your students, we had to first understand the processes of admissions. And that was never written down anywhere that we could access. Um, and so we had to uncover that for ourselves and then reconstruct it. So this took up the majority of our time. In addition, uh, you know, hiring, hiring decisions are often confidential among the faculty. So finding the notes on those decisions is difficult. But the sort of rumors about Stanford having biases against Jewish faculty um, uh, were pretty pretty easy to find. Uh, documenting them was another matter. Um, and one question about the present, a, a big one. So you noted that one of the discontinuities between the past and, and this moment is that anti-Semitism now is not coming from the top down, it's kind of coming from within the Jewish, uh, within the student community, kind of between students. And so I have to ask, I mean, what, do you, have, especially as an expert in Jewish education and education more broadly, what, what can be done about that <laughs> um, <laughs> between students and among students? Oh, my goodness. If I had an answer to that question, um, uh, I, I hope the world would be a better place. Um, I don't know. I mean, within the university, we have, we only have certain levers that we can press. So... We have identified some of the hot spots in the places. So Stanford is a residential university, which means that most of the students live on campus all four years. So everybody is living under the rubric, or most undergraduates live under the under the administrative rubric of, uh, of what's called residential education, some version of that here. And so we, so one of the levers that we can push that is to facilitate a better understanding of Jewish life and and a, a and an understanding of what Jewish students might experience as anti-Semitic is by helping roll out better trainings, more informative sessions with people who live and work in the dormitories, the residence halls, so that they can educate their residents better. Um, universities are, you know, uh, they give a lot of latitude to students. We can't, uh, there's only so many classes that one can make mandatory for students. I'm not even entirely sure if a class would be the right mode of address in this case. Um, but a whole lot of education happens in co-curricular settings like the residence halls. And so among the things that we've done is push toward the inclusion of training around anti-Semitism in the residence halls and through the residential staff so that they're really gonna reach as many students as we can. Thank you so much. I'm gonna turn things over to Ann now and she'll follow up with some more questions. Hi Ari, thank you so much. Um, yeah, there's a lot of questions, and I'm just here trying to sort of uh, put them put them in some groups so that we can get to as many of the issues that people are raising as possible. 
Um, I want to start out with a set of questions um, that uh, hopefully you'll be interested in answering that move away a little bit from admissions and towards the experience, because the name of this advisory task force was um, a task force on the history of Jewish admissions and experience. So there are some questions about what happens with Jewish student life on campus, both before and after. Did you find evidence of um, problems with the Jewish experience on, on campus and how did it change over time? Sure, um, that's a great question. Um, everybody I talked to, all of the alums that I spoke with uh, had incredibly fond feelings toward the university including uh, this one uh, student who told this harrowing story, a Jewish student from LA, told this harrowing story of having been denied and of confronting Snyder in person, um, that he was denied because he was Jewish. And, um, uh, and so he, this, this, this individual was accepted as a transfer student, didn't get in as a first year student, but got in as a transfer, graduated from Stanford. And during this conversation in which he tells me this story of confronting Stanford, uh, Snyder to his face, um, at the end, when he's talking about Stanford, he's he's weeping on the phone with me or in my Zoom meeting with me uh, as he's telling me how much he loves this place and owes it. Um, so you have a great variety of things happening at this time. I can say two other things. At the, uh, in 1955, so this is two years after uh, Snyder writes this memo, Stanford elects uh, uh, president and a vice president of the ASSU, the student the student government um, that's two Jewish students, a man named Peter Bing, who is one of our alums um, and a very generous supporter of the university in many, many ways. Um, and the other being uh, Diane Goldman, who later became Diane Feinstein, the Senator from California, um, also an alum. And so at the same time that you have Snyder saying, um, we're gonna try to do what we can to reduce the number of Jewish students, you have two Jewish students, uh, being elected as the co-presidents of the student body. Um, by and large, again, what we found, we didn't find evidence, um, at least on the level of the students and student experience of a great deal of exclusion. The kind of, um, where we did find exclusion was uh, sort of on the institutional level. So Stanford was founded in 1891 by Jane and Leland Stanford in, member of their, in memory of their son. And if you've ever been here, you would know that the sort of the, the front door of Stanford is this long road called Palm Drive, at the end of which sits the quad. And from the very entrance of Stanford, as you're leaving Palo Alto and entering the campus, uh, it's lined with these very tall, beautiful palm trees. And at the end of it, the terminus of it is the main quad. And at the, in the center of the main quad sits Memorial Church. Um, and that is the oldest part of campus. And Jane, who outlived her husband as well, uh, was really the um, sort of architect in many ways of the university. And she intended it to be a non-sectarian university, uh, but she also said, uh, the, the entire campus is my body, but the Memorial Church is my heart, she says. And there's no mistaking it for a church. And early before the 1906 earthquake, it had a cross at the top. It was very hard to miss. Um, and the, iconog the iconography is very Christocentric all throughout, even though she wanted it to be a non-sectarian university. And so if you were a Jewish student and you wanted to do anything, and in order for it to be non-sectarian, according to Jane's kind of logic, that meant that any religious anything had to happen inside the church. Um, Relig because it was, she was afraid that religious differences would tear the campus apart. So non-sectarian so means no sects. <laughs> right, non-sectarian, no sects at all. Um, uh, which of course for her was a kind of Protestantism. She didn't really think about Catholics or Jews and certainly not Muslims or anybody else. Um, but she thought this was the best way to establish a kind of uh, equal playing field among, among communities. And so if you wanted to do anything religious on campus, anything that was identified with a religious group on campus, you had to do it inside the church. And so for many Jews, this was uncomfortable. Um, until, so when Hillel was founded, it was founded off campus in uh, 1949. Um, and, but Jewish students who wanted to meet on campus sort of couldn't do so as Jewish students because that was seen as breaking that non-sectarian deal. And in fact, when issues did arise with Jewish students during the 50s and into the 60s, they were referred to Memorial Church. They were referred to the Dean of Memorial Church. So Stanford's a private university, so we have a Dean of what was called then the Dean of Memorial Church. Um, and so this also was like a kind of misread of Jewish needs. That is, there, there are very few 
Jewish students, I think, at the time who would have felt comfortable going to the Dean of Memorial Church uh, to solve their to solve their issues uh, for a variety of reasons that are sort of strange. Um, it's not until 1966 that the university votes that the Board of Trustees votes um, to allow religious life outside of Memorial Church. Um, uh, and then in 1972, it becomes part of the sort of charter of the university. Um, but for many Jewish students at the time, uh, they didn't, they, uh, they accepted the kind of terms of the university quite willingly. And like I said, every alum that I talked to had a great time with a, a couple of exceptions, but those were exceptions sort of more in the 70s, I think, and into the 80s that I heard. But most everybody that I spoke with had a pretty good time. They kind of understood the deal, which was, this is not a place that fostered, that's particularly religiously active. Um, these are California Jews as well. So California has a reputation for being kind of the least churched state, you know? Um, and so they understood that if you came you, to Stanford, that was, that, those, are the, those are the terms of engagement and they didn't, there wasn't a lot of fighting against it, not with one another, it seemed, and not against the institution until the sixties. Thank you. I think it, there's a follow-up um, that's also in the questions that I think also relates to Professor Weissman's quest, question about faculty. Um, there's a question about whether you researched um, whether there was a subtler, more sort of academically oriented discrimination against Jewish studies or Jewish topics. Um, so not necessarily in hiring faculty, but did professors dissuade their students from pursuing, for example, dissertations that might touch on on those themes. Um, if you haven't researched it, there might not be much to say, but it was a question that, that came up. We did research, we did run into the story of Jewish studies at Stanford and, and sort of how it came to be. Um, and it was already in conversation starting in the 1950s, but there was a, and the sense was there was a push in the late 50s or early 60s, I wanna say. Um, uh, Stanford didn't have a religious studies department until 1971. Um, so maybe that was late in the game, I don't know, relative to other schools, but it did have, faculty that studied religion. They just did it in Asian studies or the East Asian studies it was called or in history. Um, and there were faculty that studied Jewish topics and there was a push at one point to hire a, a professor in Jewish studies. Um, again, all the religion questions somehow ended up trickling into Memor the Dean of Memorial Church who in many ways was tasked with doing a lot of the instruction um, in the undergraduate curriculum. We didn't look at dissertations but we looked at the undergraduates primarily. And there was an effort to hire a Jewish a Jewish studies faculty person, and a few names were floated about, uh, including Jacob Neusner. Um, uh, that was in the 60s. I think earlier to that, there was uh, there was an effort to hire Jewish, a Jewish studies faculty person. Um, and uh, and they said, well, if we hire a Jewish studies person, then we're probably going to want to hire a Catholic studies person. And, then, and that was seen as a kind of balkanization of this community. And they turned that back at a certain point. And then later on, began to bring in um, scholars specifically of, of Jewish studies. But there's been a long history of faculty studying the Jewish experience or faculty studying, uh, 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 but in other departments or in other centers. So similarly, uh, so mo most of what we've been talking about in terms of experience and discrimination so far has been in terms of Judaism as a religion or conceived as a religion. Um, there are of course some questions about thinking it a bit in terms of ethnicity or race um, and whether there are whether there is a parallel history of racial or ethnic discrimination um, in the same era at Stanford and whether the two things can be compared or brought together in any way. This was the, uh, that's a that is a great question. Um, it was mostly thought of as a religion um, by the university. That is to say, when Jewish students raised issues or when the Jewish community of students wanted to get together, even to do learning, they were sent to Memorial Church. And this was a, I think this was a misread by the university in certain ways, a misunderstanding of uh, who American Jews are, how Jews see themselves. Um, the, the memo that sort of sparked our whole investigation was the only overt statement that we found that identified an American minority and an intention to reduce admits from that population. We didn't find any statements about African-Americans, Asian-Americans, Latinx Americans, none. Um, what we found instead was a kind of um, post facto like rationalization. And what they said regularly about African-Americans in particular was um, that we would be doing African-Americans a disservice uh, 
if we let them in and they were underprepared because then they would fail out. And so we we're really helping them by not letting them in. Um, but they would always say, we would love to see more better qualified applicants. This of course is not true and wasn't true back then because to the students of the well-connected and the wealthy, um, there was this incredible apparatus of tutorials and support and letters and so on uh, if, you were, if you were white and well-connected. But they would give this, they said the same about um, Latinx applicants. Um, you know, we, we would love to see more better qualified applicants, but they're just not qualified, not strong enough. Um, and so we're doing them a favor by not letting them in. But it wasn't, a, I mean, it was a concerted effort, but it wasn't articulated in the way that it was articulated in terms of Jewish applicants. So I think um, um, the follow-up to that is, is there's a whole cluster of, com uh, of questions related to um, your conclusions, particularly about the element of continuity that um, it's easy and um, that that people are quick to move towards seeing Jews as the problem, right? So, I, so several people are sort of asking, what is the problem that was seen? In other words, if um, Jews were the only group that were identified as being um, problematically concentrated <laughs> in the admissions at Stanford, um, as opposed to, you know, you just, you, you indicated that in the Ivy League, there was a much more of an explicit sense of like, what was the type of person who was supposed to go there? Stanford didn't really have that. So what was the thing that they were trying to avoid by having so many Jewish students? I think there were two. So one, excuse me, is that um, the early 1950s from the, the end of World War II through, well, till today, but really through the early 1950s, like I said, Stanford only had its first director of admissions in 1947, which meant that they only began to institutionalize the process of deciding who should come and who should not come, you know, six years before this memo was written. And that's because they were all of a sudden faced with a flood of applicants from qualified people um, who, uh, and they had to start making decisions about who they were going to admit and who they weren't going to admit. Prior to that, it was, it was called qualitative admissions. And if you basically were above a certain bar and you took a certain test, you would be admitted if you were a male student. Stanford had a cap on female students from, from Jane's time at 500. Um, so if you were male students, there was this competition. Um, and so they were seeing a rise in applications in general. And they were really trying to, they were playing catch up because they didn't have the infrastructure to make decisions about who should, uh, who should attend and who should not. Um, and so one of my reads is that the, the, the assignation of blame for this problem, like Snyder blamed the Jews for this problem, right? There's too many Jewish students. If we just reduce the number of Jewish students, it'll solve this larger problem of having just too many applicants, right? And we can do that by cracking out the Jews. Now, why the Jews? I don't really know. It, like, I do know that he was in touch with his, the, I, like we didn't find any other evidence of anti-Semitic animus in his papers or anything. Um, I do know that he talked to his colleagues at Columbia and Harvard and Penn and other schools. And so it could be that they said, oh, we had this problem back in the twenties. We just excluded the Jews. And he was like, great, I'll do that too. I don't really know what, you know, sort of underlied his thought on that. But I think the problem he was actually trying to solve was this problem of increased applications. His solution and the kind of callous way in which he went about assigning the solution to the Jewish, to these Jewish applicants from Los Angeles, uh, I think speaks to the the sort of just how deep uh, that kind of anti-Semitic thinking goes in American in American culture. There may have been also a sense that Jews sort of didn't belong at Stanford, right? They, it said, it, it, he used somewhere in the memo he uses the language of balance. It would have imbalanced the population, um, but that too was never kind of explicated in the way that it was um, in the files at at Harvard or Columbia, um, which Carabell does such a magnificent job. Carabell and Wexler do such a magnificent job of of, uh, of laying out. Um, so if it was that, that was a I think a secondary thing. I think he was dealing with this the problem of too many applicants. So. There, there are also a number of questions here about um, trying to get in a little bit to the nitty gritty of how these policies worked. Um, and so I just want to clarify what, what I think I hear you saying is that the, the discrimination took place primarily against a certain set of high schools in Los Angeles, or were there other schools around the country that were also, especially like Portland kept coming up, 
um, that that had high schools that were known to have large concentrations of Jews that had the same treatment? And if not, how did this become a wider perception beyond just LA? Uh, we only found, again, because we were working with kind of um, estimates because the, 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 the registrar only reported admits from, from these three years. Sarah had a very strong connection with Portland. There's always been a large number of Northwest <clears throat> applicants coming to Stanford. Um, and has a very strong, very old Jewish community as well. Um, but we didn't find the sort of precipitous drop off in other schools, even the Portland schools, not the Portland schools, not the Seattle schools, not schools from Chicago that also served Jewish community, uh, public schools that served cities or neighborhoods that had large Jewish populations. Um, and I checked in a bunch of other cities as well. I, you know, oh, what were the Jewish neighborhoods in Milwaukee? What were the, you know? Um, and we just didn't find the precipitous drop off among those schools. It may also have happened, but we don't know. But by reducing the number of Jewish, but we do know about these two schools because he identified them and then we could trace them through. Um, and so we felt most certain about making that claim. We didn't feel certain about making a larger claim because we did not find um, that kind of evidence. Now, of course, there were non-Jewish kids who went to these schools who may have gotten caught up in it. It was a very blunt instrument which again leads me to suspect that what he was trying to do is reduce the number of applicants overall and just do that by trying to root out the Jews. Um, but it was this very blunt uh, blunt instrument. We just didn't find it applied in the same way with the same severity elsewhere. Were there not other high schools in LA that were also supplying a very large number of? Yeah, North Hollywood High, Hollywood High School, University High School also, but we also didn't find the drop off again, quite as severe. Now, did it happen? We don't, we don't know, um, but okay. it, it might have. We just, we weren't able to establish that. Fascinating. Um, with only one minute left, I think the last question that I wanna, that I wanna put out is about the, the, the legacy. So the later history of this, um, when did these policies end? Did they die off? Was there a distinct moment when a decision was made to, to stop limiting from these schools? Great question. It's unclear. It's unclear whether he this happened for a year or two years or five years or 10 years, um, but the repercussions have lasted till today. Um, I've been asked recently if Stanford, if, if I think that Stanford admissions uh, has a, a bias against Jews. Um, I'm not at liberty to say, but I know that the whole admissions process is radically different than it was. Um, back then. So it's not so much for me the question of how long the policies were in place, but the repercussions of these policies, giving Stanford sort of uh, um, the reputation of being a place that either has or had biases um, against Jewish students, I think is, is more damning and more problematic than the actual sort of time bound nature of the policies as themselves. Even a small policy does a lot of damage yep. over time. Exactly. Yeah. Um, I guess I'll just add to that, too, that we do have uh, Jerome Carabell, who you've mentioned in the course of this hour, speaking later in this series. And, um, you know, his research is going to bring us closer up to the to the present a little bit more. So there are questions about that in the chat, and I would just defer us to, to later on. So in the meantime, I want to thank you so much, Professor Kalman, for being with us. This was really fantastic, really informative. Um, brought to light, uh, I think, a set of experiences that a lot of people are not aware of. So it's really, really helpful. And uh, thank you to Steve Weitzman, who's just gone off camera. And thank you to everyone for being here. We hope to see you. I believe the next talk is next week. We hope to see you for the rest of the series. Thanks so much. Thank you.